Um, Jessica? Yeah, um, well, I, I'm an actress, so uh, therefore it means I also am a struggling actress. So <laughs> in between jobs, you know, what do you do? What do you, what do you do for yourself? So I've always been fascinated by film. I've been kind of a film buff all my life. Um, and uh, I've always wanted to do production. I'm definitely a, um, I have that mindset. Mm -hmm. So I, when I met my husband, uh, I started working on his projects and I realized I had, a, I had a real knack for it. So I just kept producing and so I've really done a lot of work. Great, Tiffany. I have a similar story to you, actually. We just met, but I'm realizing. <laughs> um, I started, I have my background is first in acting, and then I did makeup between jobs, cool. and then I realized I wanted to do makeup on films, mm. and then I worked for free on every film. So this is when you like had backstage and you would write yeah. letters like, would you like a makeup artist on your side? <laughs> and then that, I would lie and say, yes, I know how to do that. And then I would go desperately ask people how you do this, like make a fake nose or whatever. And then um, I was like, I'm either going to be in the union and do this for my life or you know, something else. Mm. And then I did my husband's makeup on set. He wasn't my husband yet. <laughs> and we met and that was it. And we got married shortly after. And then he was a writer and a director. And so we started making, I started producing his films. And then um, he produced this one that I directed. So this is my directorial debut. And um, that's how that so the training of doing the makeup on set was how I learned how this whole system works and yeah. you know all that stuff. Yeah. I um I went to a tiny like, four hundred student liberal arts school or so and sort of studied documentary there. Graduated in two thousand and five, and moved to Boston and had a job in technology for about four years. And the company I was working for was it was a computer consulting firm and they were sponsoring the Independent Film Festival of Boston. So we had passes, so I took two of the passes and uh, saw like 12 films over the course of a weekend. I was like, I could do that. <laughs> and so I went in on Monday and gave my two weeks. Um, wow. That sounds like a wise choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so actually, I'm delighted to be screening at that festival uh, Aww, in a couple weeks, which is uh, nine years after, after that leap. Um, so sort of, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, uh, my, the beginnings of my film career sort of coincided with the DSLR wave, so I rode that for a little while when small, small cameras were making really good looking images. Um, for a while I paid my rent in vegetables, um, really. I, grew them? Grew them? Well, no, I uh, found an organic farm. I made videos for the farm in exchange okay. for a CSA, <laughs> which I gave to the house where I was living. And so that was how I paid my rent nice. for a time. Um, and so, uh, that was a few years ago. <laughs> but Dawnland is my first feature that we started actually four years ago. Um, and so I'm delighted to be here at the festival with it. Wonderful. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about, and we'll kind of come the other way, we'll try to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> Can you talk about how, um, what you, uh, before you made your first film, how either your education or your training or your work on set, like what prepared you to be able to make a film? from your previous experience. Yeah. Um, so Ben, let's start sure, with you. Yeah. So I think of nonfiction as um, sort of a process of making it up as you go along because each film is very different. So I, um, you know, I'd made a few dozen short films before starting on Dawnland, so that let me sort of practice all of the different roles as a director and editor and cinematographer, producer, um, and so when Dawnland came around, I you know, was the co-director and cinematographer of that film. And it, it was similar to all of the other short film projects, but mostly different in terms of scale and scope. Tracking a project for two years of production, 450 hours of material, two years of editing. Um, it's just uh, qualitatively a much, much different sort of beast. Yeah. Um, what prepared you? Yeah, like you, you did makeup and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you did a lot of other things on set. So, so what prepared you to go out and direct a movie? Right. So I'm super learn as you go. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that the, the thing that can prepare you the most is to have a tribe and, you know, people that will 
support you and you can admit your vulnerability to and you don't want to act like you know everything I feel like that ironically that prepares you being unprepared prepares you and having the people that can that you can lean on and sort of a click of of people that you support and support you and will hold you up at those really tough times that's the best prep that you can have because no matter, you're never going to have all your ducks in a row. You're never going to be fully like, you know, uh, know how every, every set's different. Yeah. Every set needs something different. There's certain tools that you can pick up. I think definitely PAing is a, a, a must, you know, or having a job on set. So you think yeah. that it's really important that people Very. have entry level And no, none of this like, uh, what are you paying? I mean, like, it's just, forget it. It's yeah. not, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Gonna just work, work for free, free. <laughs> be a problem solver, mm -hmm. and then you can build your tribe from yeah. this, and then you're going to be talking to each other on your breaks, and like, what are you working on? And then that's how you can build a community for yourself. Because yeah. you have to build that community in order to survive. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, nothing prepares you exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there, for production, especially for indie film, for, for smaller sets, I'd say it's, it's really, you know, I think even if you have a great budget and a big, a more a bigger production, you have everybody. Everybody has their job. You'll still sort of work together, and it'll be everybody calls it a labor of love all the time. That's really true. So um, to get started, I mean, to be on set um, as an actor, I did you know stand-in work, yeah. extra work, not too much extra work, but and I'd say maybe you know sometimes that isn't necessarily beneficial for acting, but it's definitely beneficial to be on a set, to be on big sets. Any time you can get on a big set would be do it because mm -hmm. to watch people work and the, to be able to watch people work at the top of their game is obviously the best learning tool. And I think. you see what you want to do. Yeah. You might learn, you know, to DP. Right. And you might get on set to learn how to do this, and you might be like, wait, I want to, I want to produce instead. Right. You know what I mean? You don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know until you see it in action. Mm -hmm. No, I understand that very well. <laughs> I, I started out as a, as a writer mm -hmm. and was in Los Angeles. I moved back to Atlanta. And in Atlanta, it turned out I knew a lot more about production in general than most of the other back then. Interesting. Now, Atlanta, of course, is a boom town for production. But back then, I knew a lot more. And I wound up as a director of photography. <laughs> and I wound up shooting tons of stuff yes. um, from being a screenwriter, which, yeah. was, kind of, which was kind of odd. I'd say on set. On set experience is the most important. Mm -hmm. You can learn so much in a classroom, but you've got to get out there and get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. um, and don't skip steps. Right. And don't be a, don't, you know, it, it, this, is a, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. don't, don't try and go from PA to producer because you're, yeah. you're, you're missing critical points in your career that, of information and experience that you need. Mm -hmm. um, I always recommend every producer should at least, at least coordinate one film. Yeah. If you can line produce some films, even better. Can you explain a little bit about line producing and coordinating for those who might not really have a clear understanding of what that's about? So a line producer is in charge of the line and budget. Most of the time, the line producer is the person that creates the line and budget. And a lot of times, they're a producer as well. I do all my own budget. So taken somebody else's catastrophe and fixed it. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's amazing okay. how many people don't know how to properly budget, budget. a film. Oh, God. Um, budget is a big one. And the mistakes and fringes and, and not understanding that, yeah, you're a business and you have an employer tax burden that you have to pay mm -hmm. on every single human being. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to understand every department, all the equipment needs. You need to understand how much catering costs, um, trucks. Union rates, P and W. I yep. mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a lengthy process. It takes. If I'm doing a proper budget, uh, first you got to do a schedule. I need to know how, how many days can I shoot? Right. How many days do I need my actors? And then uh, from there, do a little math and figure out okay, how much money do I have to spend? Mm -hmm. And that sometimes determines how many shoot days I can afford. Right. Right. You so know, because it's on schedule. You don't have unlimited money. Yeah, it's and it's back and forth. And so then it's a, it can take a, week, mm -hmm. a solid five day week of working twelve hour days. To get both of those documents done mm -hmm. for pass one. Yeah. Has, have you guys also had issues with budgeting or ha you know your experiences with no, budgeting? No, of course not. Oh, budgeting is really easy to budget for. <laughs> 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 easy. 
<laughs> so no, I, I guess really the question then is, yeah. how, have you how have each of you guys approached this incredibly challenging issue of budgeting, which uh, for every, every filmmaker well, is like, Lifeblood. Yeah, well, in all honesty, I have help. You know, I mean, I have to say, I've given my husband a lot of credit too. We work together, and so having a husband and wife team can have its benefits. It's, I mean, because you definitely know each other and you know what's going on. You have a little shorthand, and, and that, that, that helps. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, budget is a huge issue, and you have to definitely. And I think, again, I think working on sets and seeing what other people do and knowing where you can where you want to cut spending and where you think you can have a little extra and just be, uh, to know beforehand is a big, big thing. I can't speak on budget. I am a nightmare. Like, I'm a nightmare. I have no idea what's going on ever. My husband's worse. I mean, it's like, you'll see if he's on another panel, like, he's alive, he's say, like, you're alive, you don't know. It's like... <laughs> So we do like, hey guys, let's shoot a sizzle this weekend, you know, and then we use that to fundraise and then we just see how much we get and then we budget that way. So we go backwards right. and then, or we attach talent to a script and then we're like, oh God, this is Kristen Stewart. What are we going to, you know, now the budget's this, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So you, you, we go backwards. And it doesn't work. <laughs> so basically, that's a how not to. I don't recommend it. Telling People us. put it, you know. I, I find mean, myself crowdfunding at yeah. least five times during a film. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. And thank, and thank God lot. for that. I guess yeah. for crowdfunding. We, I mean, we haven't used. I, we personally haven't used crowdfunding yet, but I definitely know it's a very popular thing. Yeah. To, and I, and it's, I mean, I could do it in my sleep. It's right. like ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. thank God for it. But yeah. it's, a, it's a nightmare. Yeah. You don't want to do it if you. No, I do to try. Yeah. Ben, how about you? Um, I mean, in nonfiction and documentary, it's sort of a, it's, um, a snowballing process, I guess. So, like, on this film, my co-director approached me and was like, there's this thing happening in Maine, I think we should film it. And I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Get a nice schedule, it'll happen over the course of a year and a half, you know, these very well-defined shoots, sure, totally. I mean, no, that's not actually how it yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah, we spent sort of two years in Maine, one week there, one week at home. But it was just the two of us. You know, I, I work as a cinema, cinematographer and DP, so I have the gear. He had a beat up car, yeah, that's and that's all we needed. You <laughs> know, in addition to sort of permission and consent and trust, and there was a lot of that sort of non financial work that went into allowing us to make the film. But it was just the two of us, and sort of the assets that we already had and we didn't pay ourselves and so you and it's also it's as a documentary you need to you know you write a lot of grants a lot of grants and you get very very few of them um, but it helps to be able to show what you're working on to basically prove to the possible funders that you can do it and so it's a snowballing sort of effect and honestly we had our budget, we basically had nothing for most of the time period that we were making the film until we sort of got pretty late in production. And that's when we started getting some larger grants and more funders sort of piled on. But it was a shoestring operation for years and years and years. I'm kind of interested a little bit in budgeting surprises. Like, was there something that all of a sudden came up at you and you were like, Wow, I didn't see that that was happening. The licensing is is the worst, I think. Yeah, yeah the licensing, especially in our documentary, was just like... You're talking about music. Well, both, because I had archival footage. Like, for example, my, my subject, <clears throat> something really important happens in this MTV footage. Everybody sent me footage, you know, because they wanted to make this documentary on Kevin. And it's sitting on a shelf doing nothing. And then they're like, it's $40,000. And I'm like, $40,000, $40,000. And it was like him at it, the, the, in the story. It's not anything you could replace. It's not anything you could, you, you needed this. We needed this footage and $40,000. So like, I mean, our executive producer, God bless him. We got a text in the like <laughs> middle of the night. And he was like, eh, next to MTV executive, what can you do 8,000 or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is the hustle. You have to tell everybody your problem so that there's somebody who can fix it. You know, right. you can never be embarrassed. You have to be like, I can't afford this phenomenal footage. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, miracles happen. They really happen. But I mean, that was the killer for us budget wise was the licensing. It was, yeah. and, and the music. 
Yeah, like some guy, I mean, some guy literally on a mountaintop in another country, and I can't remember what country it was, we couldn't get a hold of him, and he was insisting on like $3,000 for this song. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, what's app all yeah. the time? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like begging him, like, could you do a thousand? <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, it all worked out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah mu music is definitely expensive. So people, I mean, I think a lot of people know that now. Um, but no matter no matter what, even if you use um, a composer or whatever ends up happening with music, it's going to cost a certain amount of money. Um, but uh, even just um, people forget a little bit about sometimes after the fact budgetary items like festival submissions. Exactly. Yeah. That can really add up. So mm -hmm. it's very helpful. Um, I, again, I have to credit my husband, very smart. He was able to foresee some of this stuff and, and, and also we've worked, we've done this before. So we also were able to try to ask for some waivers where possible. Um, but that's also embarrassing. You, mm -hmm. there's, a, a, there's a degree of embarrassment with, with small budget films. You mm -hmm. don't want to like, you don't want to insult anybody, mm -hmm. and you really want to be able to be a player in the game and, and you know do the right thing. But it's good. It's good to try as best as possible, producing wise, to cut costs. That's kind of part of your job, you know, yeah. in a way. Well, what was the question? The question was um, <laughs> the budget surprise. Yeah. Things oh. that wound up costing more than you expected, or maybe even let's go the other way. Things <laughs> that you were able to get free that you can't believe, because mm -hmm. every, every yeah. film has that too. Yeah. Well, the stuff that you never expect, especially in the beginning, is people don't understand how much post costs. Right. The post is always underfunded. Yeah. Every budget I yeah. get, oh, 100%. That, that I, yeah, yeah totally. It's, it's agree. always like yeah. you know, they, people put 80% of their budget in the shooting of the film yeah. and. Yeah. And your film's actually mostly made in post. Right. Yeah. You know, all you're doing is gathering, you know, your your ingredients to go into the edit room right. and put your film together. And then, you know, sound is expensive. I mean, sound to me yeah. is, you know, if you broke it down, I could probably say sound is probably 60% of your film and your it's visuals so is 40. Because if you think about it, you know, I could put a black screen up on here and with a proper sound palette tell you exactly what's going True. on in that scene. And that's how critical, you know, our ears cannot be fooled. Mm -hmm. And people make the biggest mistakes on indie films that take them from what could possibly be, you know, a level to C level is usually sound, bad mm -hmm. sound quality. Mm -hmm. And it just, it pulls you completely out of the film. That's one, um, music, as you said, people don't realize how much music licensing costs, which is why you need to have a proper music supervisor mm -hmm. if you're doing features. Um, having a post-production supervisor helps. I mean, there's a lot of people that will do this stuff. They'll do multiple shows. Right. So you can get them inexpensively, you know, you don't get them 24 hours a day, but you know, you've got a professional that can help guide your mm -hmm. film through it and take some of the weight off of you mm -hmm. in the, the post process. Yeah. And so the music supervisor can help with rights clearances mm -hmm. and yeah. that sort That's of thing? That's their job. They know, they know who to get the deals from. It is a lot of work. I mean, we didn't have one, mm -hmm. but uh, I would definitely say if we could have afforded one, that would have been very, very nice. Yeah. Um, composers. There's a lot of great composers out there. So when we did our film, our composer's name is Austin Wintory. Mm -hmm. And he actually uh, is the first composer. He does a lot of video games. You probably, has anybody play um, a video game from Sony called Journey? It was a two hour journey. It was just kind of like a first person view and you just take this character through all these journeys. But the soundtrack was beautiful. He actually got nominated for a Grammy for this. <laughs> so we, you know, and, and we loved it. We got a hold of Austin. We talked to him, we made a deal. And then at the end of the day, his connections, he had a, we had a 65 piece live orchestra for our entire score wow. in Macedonia. So he's doing a Skype session across the planet, working with his orchestrator in Macedonia with his beautiful 65 piece orchestra on a film noir score, a la Jerry Goldsmith and kind of like Chinatown meets um, LA Confidential. And How cool. It really wasn't that expensive, you know. Yeah. You know, we worked the deal, and he was happy, and you know, he wanted to do film noir. He'd never done it, so mm -hmm. we really gave him also a lot of latitude mm -hmm. to really be creative and do what he wanted to do. Yeah, and it that's made, important. Made yeah. a huge difference. That'll bring the down film. the price. <laughs> yeah, it really will. So you know, you can there's always deals to be made. Yeah. Somebody needs something, you know, pay them some money. They need yeah. this particular thing for their career. Yeah. 
You got a win-win. Somebody needs video. Somebody needs vegetables. Somebody needs Absolutely. a place to live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, if we're talking about like ways to be efficient in the film production, like a lot of people will, especially in documentary, just simply not pay themselves at all. Yeah, ever, I know. Which yeah, you yeah. shouldn't do. Like yeah. when you're starting the film, you don't have budget to pay yourself. Fine. Right. But when you're putting together a budget and submitting to funders. Like, you should have a line item yeah. in there for you, yeah. for mm -hmm. sort of the key creative talent, yeah. because a funder is going to look at your budget and say, well, is this sustainable? Like, if we, if we fund some portion of this film's budget, will they be able to continue making this film? Yeah. And it's not sustainable to make that uh, mm -hmm. film full time mm -hmm. if you have no other sources of income. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. yeah. Would you say on grants that's a big, that's a big deal, that it, um, on your grant application it shows that you're paying yourself? Because I think a lot of people, when filling out grants, particularly at the beginning of their process, they think that it looks better for them not to pay themselves. Right. But would you say that grantors are looking for you to pay yourself? Yeah, and this is speaking from my experience as somebody that writes grants. I've, I've never been on the review committee for a nonfiction grant, but yes, it's my understanding that I, I don't think you'd be taken seriously if you you have like a two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar budget and you're not on it. Yeah. Yeah. But now yeah. to to that, I put myself my salary in a in a budget that I presented to private investors, and they got mad. Really? Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Really? They judged Interesting. the the pri the price I gave myself, which was less than a teacher's salary, of course. You know, yeah. like I was not it was not like anything, and they were like. Yeah, you had a problem with that. You were like paying yourself, and you know. <laughs> what, what do they think you're doing? Well, I don't know. The, the I don't know. I think also, you know? I think but people, I think for and realistic people, and there's this you know. perverse expectation that if you're making a film that has some type of social impact, like you should yes. be in it just for yeah. that. Yeah. Right. You, 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 right. You know, it should right. be. Yeah. Yeah. And in reality, you have to advocate for yourself in this yeah. world yeah. in general. You know, and it's, there's a there's definitely a balance of being sort of like somebody who's, who like is has an ego about getting paid or you know feeling like there's an ego to it or just just genuinely saying I'm I you don't always work for free. Sometimes you have to work for free. Like when you're first starting out and you do PA jobs, like we said, mm -hmm. like definitely work for free when you when you can when it's when it's serving you and you're really getting something very much out of it. But if you want to make a project and you're serious about it, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking for mm -hmm. a salary. Mm -hmm. you know? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, if you have investors saying, why are you paying yourself, walk away. Yeah. No, it's not worth it. Yeah. Walk, it's not walk away. I mean, because that, that's obviously, that, that's just the tip of the iceberg yeah. of the problems yeah. you're going to have with yeah. this person. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good yes. point. Yes. Very true. This is called show business, not show fun. There yeah. you go. I mean, yeah. it's a business. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're, we're in this business to make money, but have fun while we're doing it. But yeah. at the same yeah. time, yeah. you got to pay the bills. Yeah. yeah. So don't be afraid to put a salary in for yourself. Don't put yeah. something huge. Right. Because again, the first place most financiers go to is the producer line. And they right. want to see, right. you know, is it in line with the rest yeah. of the budget? Like just in order to make the film, just so that you can work, just so that you can, like you were saying, so you can yeah. see it through, and, and that they can trust you. It's right. So you don't have to work a second job right. while you're shooting your film. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm interested in everybody's like first time experience on a film that was yours, not to, not as a PA, ah. but on a film where you are a a principal in some way. Can you talk about some of the struggles oh, and some of the... <laughs> so why don't we start... Yeah, Jessica, why don't you right. start? Well, since, since, know, God, since you have a sparkle yeah. in your eye, which might be not nice, but <laughs> I, know, I, just, well, my, I think you might have something to tell us. Uh, yeah, well, my first... So it was actually um, a movie that we made for $12,000, and I produced it. And it was, yeah, I mean, it was just insane. It was insanity because if there's no budget, essentially. That's, that's really not like a micro budget. That's a, that's a no budget. You're just sort of making something to, to learn to make it. And so I wore all the hats. I did a lot of work. It was, it was I, I made a lot of mistakes. And I think, you know, it's like, it is important to make mistakes in life, you know, because you really do learn that way. Mm -hmm. you, you learn exactly the lay of the land. Um, but that was, it was just a crazy fun experience. Do you have, do you have a story that might illuminate <laughs> such mistakes? Um, well, I was, I was like, I was doing a lot. I, the, thing came, the thing that comes to mind is we had a great actor. Um, he's a really, really nice guy, but he was, he was like very Justin Bieber, too cool for school. He was like, he was very like, he was just, it was, I, I love him, he was a great guy, but he was very funny. And he asked if we had like a gym. <laughs> I was like, no, we don't have a gym. 
Um, and he would ask me to get him coffee. Like I'd be filming the scene. Right, I was right, right. acting in the movie. They don't get it. They and don't I'd be filming the scene, the... and he'd ask me to get him coffee. Yeah. And I was like, just give me a sec. You know, I'll be right with you. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That it helps when they can see yeah. like the big picture. Like yeah, what's yeah. really what what do these yeah. this, what does this team have, and what yeah. do they not have? Right. What I've noticed is that it's because I've worked with some with pure list, you know, right. top of the line. Um, the higher up they are, the nicer they are. Yes. yes. It's the second 100%. tier guys totally. 100%. that are the ones that you have to hold their hand the mm -hmm. whole time yeah. mm -hmm. because they're oh, just they're they're because they're not a list. Yep. They want to be up there just like everybody else does, but they're not there. But they're the ones that tend to become the prima donnas, mm -hmm. and I don't think they realize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then you know, uh, so a couple of them, like one who will remain nameless. Um, came on set, and this guy is, you know, we've seen this guy since the 70s. I mean, mm. he is a huge, huge, huge mm -hmm. star. Still works today, still headlines movies. Mm -hmm. And walked around and literally shook hands with every crew and introduced himself by his first name. Hi, I'm, you know, Joe. And That's you nice. were, yeah, I know who you are, but yeah, yeah. that was yeah, the kind yeah, of guy yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that was that very, a long way. It, yeah. And then That's still working. We're done. Yeah, yeah. And then every day when we get finished shooting, he would go outside and start on waiting all day, 12 hours, for him, and That's to the so point nice. that we'd have to pull him away after about an hour and say, "Dude, you got to go home and sleep, man. We got another 12-hour day tomorrow." <laughs> right. yeah. and, and he would have stayed there all night and signed everything that people put in front of him. That's nice. So, you know, <laughs> this, That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, Tiffany, you want to talk about? Oh your my first? god! Because I saw your face kind of. <laughs> I mean, my poor husband's directorial debut, Falterize. I was producing it, and um, I mean, it was like a war zone, and. I remember one day in particular, we were we had Barishnikov space, and um, it was a dance movie. We had these amazing dancers like that you would pay billions of dollars to see dance right now, and they um, from Martha Graham company, and wow. they um, they were in the room, and it's this big scene, big scene, and the lead was a dancer. You know, he's having trouble with the lines, whatever. You know, and this is his acting scene. Um, Desmond, he's an angel. And the little guy who managed the Barishnikov Center, they were having a gala that night. And he just kept coming up and being like, you're not done yet, you're not done yet, you're not done yet. How are you gonna get this all out of here? You know, and he was applying this pressure to me um, about this. So on the like 90th harassment of him, I stormed in to where they were filming and my husband said, I need more time. And I said, in front of the whole crew, I know you need more time, but I don't have it. Yeah. And, and everybody still to this day talks about <laughs> this story <laughs> because the poor guy who didn't know his lines and everything, he was just like pissed. And you know, la now we all laugh about it, you know, but like Jace yeah. was like, okay, I knew you had lost your marbles that day. You yeah. needed to go home and take a <laughs> yeah. nap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the pressure that you have from all directions, and and then this is my husband, so I can yell at him. You right, know what I mean? Right. But it's like, the, you know, everybody's like, Tim, no, no, he's the director. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, right, 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 right. Although you are a producer, <laughs> and I was a producer, so uh, we we always direct. use that. We, I've, you know, I work with all these people still to this day, and we always quote that. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, uh, I had an accountant one time. Um, have a mental breakdown <laughs> in the middle of the shoot. It'll happen. And oh, left no. and didn't no. tell anybody. Oh, oh man. No. We didn't know it for a couple days. We figured he was sick. He just, we were trying to get a hold of him. And then finally he decides, uh, we, we got a hold of his girlfriend and he, we found out he had um, locked himself in his bedroom and wasn't coming out. <laughs> Oh my God! And now, it's the accountant. This is the this is my production accountant. <laughs> this is the person with the checkbook. <laughs> and this is week two oh, no. on a major union feature. Oh, wow. oh, now, for those of you that have never done a major union feature, week two in payroll land is when you're Lots of, yeah you have a stack of mm. crew start work this high that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. It's your first week's payroll, yeah. and if you're late. Guess what that union crew is going to do? They're either going to walk, right. or they're going to be really, really, really silly and never trust you for the never rest trust of, you yeah. for the rest of the shoot. Mm -hmm. So I got with the um, assistant accountant on a Wednesday, and we were up till four in the morning, scanning and filling out all the start work that we had to fill out, mm -hmm. calculating all the time cards, getting them scanned up and sent off to the payroll company, mm -hmm. who did me a solid and turned it around by middle of the next day, so I could see how big was the cast. Uh, 
crew was about 80. Yeah. And yeah. cast was probably 30, but yeah, yeah, you know. But I, wow. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, no, it was, you know, it was a full, full feature. Wow. And uh, flip it around, and then by Friday, fortunately, you know, we were set up so we could print checks in the office. See, it um, up. I'm printing checks at 5 p.m., and thank God we were on a split starting at noon. Yeah. So lunch was at 6, so I could literally walk on a set normal Friday, hey, everybody, it's lunchtime, here's your checks. And <laughs> word had already started spreading through the crew that things were uh, amiss. Yeah, that the accountant. <laughs> so um, another lesson, learn how to do accounting. <laughs> because you never know when you may have to just sit in that seat <laughs> and become a production accountant. And yeah. I basically became production accountant. And lesson number two, you were not well. thanked well. for saving the day, I bet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> never yeah. thanked. Thankless. No, I, no everybody, yeah. no. everybody kind of knew. And yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. they, they don't teach you taxes in, in school, and everybody makes that joke. Mm -hmm. There's memes everywhere about, like, why don't we learn, like, the parallelograms but no taxes. It's true. We, you, yeah. you, should learn, you should learn accounting. Just, you know, take it up in your, pet, in your, in your spare time. It's a, it's a good <laughs> skill to have as a producer yeah, to yeah. understand how, awesome. the, how the accounting works behind sure. the scenes. Um, and again, also so you can double check your accountant. Yeah. And make sure you're not getting ripped off, yeah. which is common. Ben, can you talk a little bit about your first uh, endeavor into where you were in, you know, a, yeah. a principal on a project? I don't know if I have any sort of pithy dynamite stories, because <laughs> uh, it's all challenging, right? Um, and the challenges on each film are different. And uh, yeah, I've been sitting here trying to think if I have anything that sort of encapsulates a, a larger lesson. And unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> that I can think of right now. That, Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. I don't you. Oh, no, you're yeah. quite the opposite. It's like there's so many yeah. Yeah. challenges. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what, yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess Stamina. Uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll have a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience, because um, we'd like to kind of go half and half, like 45 minutes of us talking, 45 minutes of you guys having questions, I hope. And uh, so let's talk about your current film. Like, how did it get started? What what got you onto the project? What was it that attracted you to it? And how did it become, go from being just an idea you had to like, we're going, we're making this, which is, I think, a big step. So do you want to start, Jessica? Uh, sure, sure. Um, uh, well, actually, I, I'm married to my husband, that goes without saying, and so he's the writer-director. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, um, I, I, it's in my contract, uh, he has to put me in every <laughs> that, so, is that the marriage contract? That is, or that's, is that that's the yeah. vows. It's in the vows. We actually said it while, while we were, yeah, it's like, we make his thrive. Yeah, no, so, no, so um, uh, that's really how, how it, it started. That's why, you know, I was on the project. And so um, it, from, from inception to post was about, I'd say, three years plus. Mm -hmm. um, and he really was writing it for um, a few years before that. Um, so it, it does take a long time to write something that's, that I think you're ready to film. Um, but he's a really talented um, filmmaker and he really understands the, re the whole process from A to Z. Um, he's on the next panel actually, I think, so he'll yes, be able he to is. talk a lot more about this. But basically, um, you know, we, uh, it's a funny story. We actually um, got married uh, a week and a half before, <laughs> or, like the month before we shot. <laughs> So that it was sounds a, smart. It was, a, it was very intelligent, and it was a, it was a real fun two months. Uh, we, it was because of you know, actor availability, crew availability, what we, how we wanted to do it. So it had to be these dates. Um, it, it did work out, but it was crazy. We had a week and a half of pre-production, which I don't recommend. Um, and, and, I, and I had done a lot of work before then, too, before the wedding and before you know, we went away. So uh, it, it, And then we had 15 shooting days. Um, I have to say, a film shoot is an unconventional honeymoon. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we also took a honeymoon, which was great. It was actually helpful. We relaxed, then we came we came to the to the to the crazy, you know, we're very relaxed. So that was really good. Um, and yeah, and then uh, obviously, um, post takes about, you know, a full year and a half. I would say. Yeah. So um, I mean, he had written the script. Yeah. And at what point are you like, we are making this ourselves? Um, well, he, that's, that's, that's his method, you know, he's been making his own movies for, this is his fourth technically, um, but this, this was, um, we, we've been preparing to do this for a few years, um, which I think is, is necessary. You really have to be prepared, for, yeah, you, it, there's so much that goes into a film that 
Uh, you need to trust everybody around you. Uh, if you're making a small indie film, you have to trust everybody around you. You have to have a great team of people. You have to really know what you're doing. And so it, it takes a few years to be ready, I would say. It takes more than that, but yeah. So we, what, what really, you know, it's hard to describe. Like, I know this is really about, like, how do you get on your feet? Mm -hmm. But I, I'd say, like, it, you know, my honest opinion about that is that it, it, it takes a lot. It's not just, I don't think it's easy to just write a script and make a movie. No. It's, it's, oh. it's, it's very, very hard. So um, uh, the, the best way to put it is that you really have to have people around you that you trust mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to make a small movie. So this one had been in works yeah. for five years? For, so. Yeah, for, for years. So that's, that's really what it comes down to. In terms of uh, casting and, um, you know, f finding everybody, it just, uh, it, 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 it takes time and so you have to really be prepared and, um, yeah, that's all I, that's all I, all I can well, say. Can you talk about that? And then also, can you talk a little bit about why Cleveland? Why did you come <laughs> here and shoot and, okay. and all of that? Well, the writer's from here, so mm -hmm. the, the writer Edward Lee, Edward Lee Quinnett um, wrote the script. It was originally called, uh, we titled it Legacy um, when we started putting this project together. Um, he'd presented me uh, a version of the script four years ago, and I had read it and I'd liked it, and I said, you know, we got to get, you know, got to get some financing together. And he'd been working, you know, local financiers here in Cleveland trying to put together his, uh, his dream of having his movie made. And he uh, called me in May of 2016. Yeah, it had been 2016. And said, I got the money. I'm like, really? He flew out to LA. I was living in LA at the time. And he said, we gotta get a director. So I called my friend David A. Armstrong, my fantastic director. He was also the cinematographer of the Saw series. Oh. 30 year veteran of the industry. And, and uh, so we all met, and we met at a cigar bar in, in Sherman Oaks, and we're having, I mean, literally like out of a, a movie set. I mean, we're all smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and talking about, let's make this movie. And we're like, oh, okay, let's make a movie. It'll be great. So we get started, and then, so Dave's uh, fiance, Valerie Grant, is also a screenwriter. So she took uh, Ed's script and created a production version of the script and, and added some more nuances and, you know, a few things that you know she had to look female characters and things like that to really but, but the, idea, the original was kind of a you know it's it's there's a definite undercurrent of cleveland 1970s mob years you know right, the old right, danny right, green right. versus the italian mob the undercurrent basis of the story and then she took that and you know turned a little bit more contemporary so that you know we could actually afford to shoot it because period pieces are incredibly expensive, and so we uh, we got it done and we sent it around to all the agents and we ended up uh, putting some offers in on um, Justin Chatwin if anybody knows from Shameless and uh, Peter Stomata who we've all seen in a hundred movies but probably most famously everybody remembers is he's the guy that put uh, Steve Buscemi. We shimmy through the wood chipper in Fargo. Oh, yes. Um, and we've seen him in, you know, Minority Report. He, he you know, plucked out Tom Cruise's eyes, and Armageddon, oh, he was yeah. the crazy Russian. And so good. So, so, we, so we got those two guys, and then um, uh, we were putting this all together, and then I started working and line producing, co producing my friend Dahmer before I did this one. Oh, wow. So I went from my friend Dahmer over the summer, I was home for eight days, only to turn around because we were going on this wow. one, right, jump back into pre-production because of schedules. Yeah. Um, but as we know, you know, Cleveland weather plays a part. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, when I'm, what's, my, what's the latest shoot day I can go to because I need as much prep as I can on this thing. I, we had basically 20 days in 32 locations mm -hmm. with a, you know, 80 person crew. <laughs> yeah, it was a suicide you had mission. 20 day and location. 32 locations? Yeah, and, and some big ones, including Severance Hall. So uh, I'm looking at the weather patterns. I'm trying to figure out how can I go, because we know we need, we need the fall colors, and you know, when are the leaves going to turn, when's the snow going to come? And I finally <laughs> went. <laughs> That's crazy. You would think so. <laughs> I went to the Farmer's Almanac. <laughs> no. I went old school. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I went through each week and looked, and the Farmer's Almanac said the first snow in Cleveland was going to be November 20th. So I said, okay, well, our final shoot day is going to be to Friday, November 19th. Mm -hmm. So we get to our final shoot day. It was a night shoot. 
we were shooting what ends up being the first scene in our film, a big um, a drug heist. Huge set, we're outdoors, we've got fans, we've got trucks, we've got AK-47s, people in gear, it's just a crazy scene. It was 70 degrees at 6 p.m. It was 65 degrees at 3 a.m. And then the cold front came in. And the whole bottom just dropped into the temperature. By the time we got done around 6, so we're packing the truck, a light mist had started. It was about 40 degrees. We got our trucks packed up. We all went back to the hotel room, slept, woke up around 2 in the afternoon, and there was a sideways blizzard with a <laughs> Well, I had always known about Kevin because of my makeup background, and um, he's an icon. And I mean, you, <clears throat> you, you know what? I just realized that what really started it was I was talking about Kevin because some I said somebody else wanted to be Kevin O'Quan you know, an Instagrammer, mm -hmm. you know, like an Instagram makeup person. And my intern at the time, now she's like a producer, but um, she said, who's that? And I said, who's Kevin O'Quan? And she said, no, I don't know who he is. And I was like, this is a problem. Like, because that I got all his books down and started looking and showing her. She was like, oh my God, he invented contour? He invented, you know, what? You know, this is crazy. And so I started going, is there a documentary on Kevin? And there was a big retrospective of him in LA at the makeup show that was happening. And so I sent her to go film that and we put the footage together in a sizzle reel and then we started making it. And then we got um, an interview with Isaac Mizrahi, which is kind of what kicked off it being like, you know, documentary about Kevin, you know, documentary about Kevin. And, you know, through our connections, I had connections to a couple actresses. I didn't know people, anybody who had met him. And our DP, God bless him, you know, was just working for free. And, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be like, one, I remember one in particular, I went into the movie, I'd been working on getting an interview with like, Campbell for like, I want to say like eight months, and she was like, "I go into a mood, and it was like 3 p.m. the the other night." The other night. So so I don't know. I had to get every, I, this is this was our life. You know, I'd be like, I that was our relationship or whatever. And, but you know, you needed two, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> you know, you had to, like in a matter of like eight hours, you had to put it in like for two. Like it was, one time I, I, uh, I wrote her and heard back maybe a month later, all of a sudden, Kate wants to do this. Um, are you in London? Because she can't come to the US. And I was like, yes, I'm in London. <laughs> what do you mean? Of course. And I said to Andres, can we go to London? <laughs> and then she was like, oh, this is more fun because, you know, Kate gets $10 million campaigns on a whim. So, you know, can't the so you'll have to understand that we'll want it to be 11-11. Uh, November 11th, I'll we'll never forget the date. But if it's not, I'm so sorry, please don't be mad. You know, because I'm not, she's not being paid. Nobody was paid. Right. None of the models were paid. So I was like, oh my God, I'm putting my family on a flight to London. I said, well, we have a crew in London that's ready to go. And you know, what do you do have a crew in London? Like, I don't know what, what this, so See, I was this like. This is a good lesson, guy. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. I was like, please, God. 
I'm getting on this plane with my son and, you know, taking our whole family to take this chance on 11-11, you know, not knowing if Kate was going to show up. We got the Rosewood to give us the space. We got the amazing crew from Nat Geo, you know, who discounted their rates so much because it was Kate, you know. Um, and I was like, two minutes before Kate's supposed to show up and we sat there at three o'clock and... I get a text and I'm like, like so scared. And the crew doesn't like. Everybody knows the deal. I'm like, oh my god, she's coming, you guys. And you know, it's just 15 minutes late, like nothing, like nothing. And then she walked in and we interviewed her, and she was like amazing. And it all. That was scary. I can believe it. <laughs> ben, can you talk about how your film became a reality? Yeah. Um, so my co-director, Adam Mazo and I had worked on a previous social issue documentary film that we didn't end up finishing. Um, and so we, we sort of knew how to work together. And he came to me one day and it was like, hey, did you know that state child welfare workers are stealing Indian kids and giving them to white families? And I was like, what? Really? And so, I mean, I, I live in Boston. I grew up in Connecticut. I went to public schools. I'm non-native. No idea. So I was like, okay. Is, is, and, then, and then he told me that there was a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission happening, like a TRC like in South Africa uh, after apartheid. Here in Maine? Is somebody making this? Somebody's making this film. Nobody's making this film. Oh, we have to make this film. So it was, you know, a long process of getting um, conversation, getting consent with the people that were doing the commission. But eventually, we were sort of permitted uh, inside the inner workings of, of the commission, and we, um, you know, uh, talked to and filmed with a lot of the people that were coming forward to give testimony to the commission. And so it started off as a film about sort of this commission and the work they were doing, and it ended up being sort of a much larger film about the history of indigenous child removal in this country. Um, sort of uh, something Child I think, removal. yeah, like, you know, your uh, social worker saying, uh, you know, you don't have enough windows in your house. Sorry, your home is unfit. You know, we have to take mm. the kids. And this is something that we think about happening like wow. in the 1800s or the early 1900s. And by the 70s um, in this country, one out of three Native American kids had been taken from their homes and we're living in boarding schools, adoptive homes, or foster homes. Mm. This is literally a third of all Native kids were living outside of their homes. Mm. And so, you know, as a non-Native, I'm <clears throat> embarrassed to say I knew nothing about this. You know, it's just not something that I was taught, and that's something that we hope this film can help correct. You know, we'd like to sort of use it as an educational tool and sort of share also what this commission in Maine did in the realm of sort of truth-telling and healing because this problem didn't just happen in Maine, it happened all over the country. And also it's a practice that the United States modeled for other colonial powers, Australia, Canada, so. Wow, so really the subject kind of found you. Yeah. In a yeah. Way, not unlike Tiffany, where the, you know, where no choice. there was a <laughs> film that had to be made and you were there. Yeah. So. I think that maybe has to be settle up, make it. be open, you know. Be it open. more often than we would think that it's yeah. less of like I know what I want to do, yeah. Than what you want to do kind of comes to you. Oh yes, and any I know what I want to do that we might have had going into this was quickly corrected. That, same here, yeah. Mm -hmm. like yeah, this we might. When you're making plans, right? My husband had a fully financed movie. We had Jason Isaacs and Patricia Arquette attached, and it was going to go in April. And J we called Jason, and we're like, we're going, we got the financing, and he was like, oh, I don't respond to the role anymore. And so, Actors. I know it was, no, but I know it was, it was so. Kevin being like, listen, we, we're doing my movie. <laughs> That's what it was. He was like, no, 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 you're not going to do this thriller in Wisconsin. No, you're doing my movie, and you're gonna go pray that Kate shows up. Like, I swear to God, because that just does not happen, you know? No, that's incredible. I think, you know what, it's probably time for us to open up for questions. I'm sorry I'm looking at my cell phone um, on occasion, and I'm doing it because there's no clock in this room. I don't know if anybody has noticed. So I'm just trying to kind of keep a sense of how time is going. I'm not, like, checking messages. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Go ahead. I'll get on 
Okay, we have a microphone over here. If you've got a question, uh, raise your hand and she'll point that so we can hear you record. Someone's got a question. Everybody's afraid to go first. Everybody. I know. That's One question started. Yeah. So it was interesting to hear you say about um, progression into the industry by right? just getting yourself exposed, working for free, taking the step by step understanding of how the business works and then growing through the ranks. Can raw talent bypass some of those steps and make that cycle shorter? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, that's the hope, you know, that talent does. You're, you're hoping that, that it, that, you know, the clouds open up and you can, talent will be seen. But I do think that, um, I think a lot of people are talented. I think that this industry is, is there's a, I, I have to say, I meet talented people every day, um, genuinely talented people. So I think that what sets people apart is hard work. And I don't think that, that you, there's really nothing that can replace hard work. Talent is actually something that can be like cultivated and, and you, you need to sort of nurse it and, 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 and creativity needs to really exist already and then you have to kind of, it kind of grows. But hard work is something that you can really work at. So it's something that you can kind of take by the reins and say, like, I can at least have control over this part. Um, and, and that's when your tribe comes in too, yeah. you know, and you start saying, you know, do you need someone to do this? Yeah. Do you need someone to do that? And in the documentary world, access is yeah. the, it's, the to thing, the equipment like, and stuff, or no, to the, to the to the topic, to the subject, to yes. the people, to the thing. Yeah. Like you can, uh, there are a lot of first-time documentary filmmakers who have no experience making a film at all, but because they have access to the thing, mm. like there's the film that you know you start shooting it and you build a, a tribe, a crew of people around you. You you find support for it, but that's the most critical thing in nonfiction. I'd say uh, in you know. Feature land, it's hiring crew people that are smarter than you, <laughs> trusting them, and and understanding that you know you don't know it all, mm -hmm. and understanding that what you don't know, you need to be able to trust someone uh, or find someone that does know it to to protect you and oh. help you and, and and you know guide the process. I'm not a mm -hmm. DP or a cinematographer. I wouldn't know. You could put a camera from me. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, I could look at the lens. Like, oh, that looks pretty. But you know, outside of that. Yeah, you, you just really need to be very clear and make sure you're hiring people that have a lot of experience, especially if you're new. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in, you know, if you, as a perfect example is, is if you're working with a first-time director, do not hire a first-time DP. Right. You know, <laughs> that would be a disaster. You know, that's a recipe yeah. for disaster um, because neither of them know what they're doing and it's, it's just going to be, yeah. you know, you're going to end up having to shepherd the whole thing. So you, you know, try and pr help protect your people. Yeah. Right. You know. Right. I do want to speak a little, just for a moment, to the uh, talent question that was uh, brought up, which is um, I went to uh, AFI, and at AFI, um, you know, while I was there, there were people who were distinctly talented, yeah. mm -hmm. who were absolutely brilliant, yep. and you could tell yeah. cinematographers, directors, producers, mm -hmm. right, know. who were just that good, and they immediately moved into the industry at a very, very high level right after AFI. So um, the th and USC is similar, to, mm -hmm. you know, um, NYU maybe, yeah. um, but. If you come out of a high-end um, graduate program um, with a good product, then yes. then you can skip mm -hmm. some steps. Absolutely. Right. That's and as far as I can see, like that's the best. That's the yes. only way yeah. to skip. The steps. But you're not really yeah. skipping steps because you're learning. True. And you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're on set creating your own, you know, short films True. for right. the school. Absolutely. Right. And and yeah, yeah. you know you don't have to be doing you don't have to do features. Short films yeah. will give you the same experience, and and you'll go through the same process. And of course, crewing for your classmates, so you're yeah. learning the whole realm of, of yeah. jobs. Yeah. And I think even the, not that you're going to be an expert in each thing, but I think it would help to definitely know a little bit about each thing. You know, you definitely mm -hmm. don't like you know get distracted and focus on things and try to be a jack of all trades. But um, it, it you know I think it's helpful to to maybe not skip <coughs> steps or like not not focus on that. You're going to end up doing that maybe like that. Mm -hmm. Those people that you're talking about, I think you know, you get life is you get lucky. There, that does happen. So um, you'll you might skip steps anyway, but to but to be sort of concerned with that or focused on that would be maybe not what I would advise. I agree. I fully yeah, agree yeah. With that, <laughs> no doubt. Um, other questions? 
We have a question coming in from Sharon on YouTube. <laughs> So, you have all mentioned having a support system and group of people you can trust. Did your parents and siblings help you when you started this into this type of work, and how did they support you? Good luck! Oh, that's crazy! Why'd you choose this life? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. No. Here's $25 for Kickstarter. No. No. My parents have been emotionally supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Always kind of behind me and what I wanted to do. Yeah. I wanted to be a crazy long haired musician. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they came to my screening last night. My yeah. mom sat right next oh. to me and my dad. Oh, and, that's nice. and it was a really nice night. So, yeah, I, having that home support system is great because it, you know, it gives, like, I call my dad a lot, mm -hmm. and he just lets me vent sometimes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's nice to be able to have someone outside of this business yeah. that you can just talk, and they may not understand what you're talking about, yeah. but it doesn't matter as long as they keep giving you the effort of, yes, yes, you're okay, don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 My, dad, my dad's barometer is always like, does everyone think she's crazy? Does everyone think he's crazy? Because <laughs> like, then it's not just you, you know what I mean? That's always his, that, like, oh, yeah, they do. Okay, so it's not me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what I would do without my parents' emotional support. I mean, they've been the best parents. Um, but sure, they did. They wanted me to have an easier life. Yeah. You know, they want, like I went to uh, a, a regular college and I thought maybe I'd be a psych major and yeah. maybe, I'll, maybe I'd be a psychiatrist, you know. Mm -hmm. But then when I got a C in biology, I think that was not <laughs> exactly my, my trajectory. But I think that they, you know, they're, they're very, my parents are very supportive. My, my um, family, my friends are, you know, very su supportive. I think you definitely, you know, don't want pe don't want negative influences in your life too much. You know, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Yes, to everything they said, and I would <laughs> add that I think our partners and spouses are yes. untold heroes Obviously. in yeah. in this work because they're the ones that have to deal with us. Yep. Saying, mm -hmm. I have to go to this place tomorrow, yep. or coming home and being, <laughs> you know, after a feedback screening and being completely demolished about yeah. somebody like just taking your film apart yeah. and like you've spent the last three years working on this thing and they have, you know, yeah, I, I think our partners and spouses are have to deserve a, a lot of respect. Special, yeah. special when, you're, when you work with your, your spouse, that's, yes. that's yeah. a special, special thing. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, my, my dad who's passed away now um, mm -hmm. would always um, have ideas for script uh, yeah. about yeah. my films. <laughs> yeah. And he'd be like, what about a scene? Like, and, Actually, a lot of times they were really Pretty good. Pretty amazing, yeah. And so I had an unpaid script consultant for quite great. some time who was, who was really good. So, But I do think that support system, yeah. familial support system, yeah. is almost, it's almost impossible to do this without having people around you yeah. kind, of, kind of lifting you up. Because there is you know, a lot of downs in yeah. this and process. And so little validation for like you what you're doing. Really thick skin. Can we, talk, can we talk just about that a little bit, about how you develop the thick skin necessary? Is it just choice. so much pain? If, if anybody else has um, you know, advice for me, yeah. I'll, saying, I'll take it. You know, uh, I, I, I mean, I have gotten a thicker skin over the years, but for sure, I think that that's what you do, I think to enter into the to show business, you are searching for validation. Like, you are. You want yeah. it, and it's something that you must crave. Um, so it's this really, you're looking to find this this beautiful balance between really wanting that wanting that so much but also not needing it and it's like impossible like everything else in, in balancing active life mm -hmm. yeah other questions Stephen coming back there um, I was curious as to uh, what non-filmic experiences would you say have had the greatest impact on your filmmaking I was a nerd, so when um, when DSLRs became a thing, it's like you know, it's still a camera that you put a nice lens on, like in you know, 2007, 2008. Like it was more or less impossible to shoot like long form stuff on them, or you'd like sync sound. Like they didn't they didn't have microphones that plugged into them, so you had to shoot dual system sound. Like pluralized didn't exist for syncing stuff up. So uh, sort of the beginning of my career, uh, my production company making you know, short documentary stuff for the web with DSLRs was in large part possible because I was like one of the people in my area that knew how to use them and could create that image. Just speak for myself. I'd probably say uh, the, 
year and a half I did as the general manager for uh, the Abbott rental facility helped. Just that hard business experience of being responsible for an entire division mm -hmm. and having P&L responsibility mm -hmm. that, you know, hey, you know, and people aren't going to get paid if you don't do your job. How about from your uh, rock band experience? Because uh, <laughs> I also play in bands. So. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm kind of I mean, interested to know. The, just the dealing with, you know, the club owners and the traveling around from club to club and scraping together a living, you know, and, and trying to maintain uh, the, the best performance you can do definitely helps. Um, it just, it's, it's all about life's experience. You know, it's what makes us who we are, and, and it tends to translate into your filmmaking. Yeah. Jessica, do you have? Um, well, I've bartended a lot, so that's <laughs> certainly eye-opening for, for people watching, for just any, just name it. Um, but I, yeah, life experience, yeah, for sure. In terms of producing, um, being able to kind of juggle a lot of different things at the same time, and and being uh, having a, keeping a sharp mind in a in a in a pressure like a very high pressure setting would be you know I think bartending and waiting tables really help that actually because it just it just same same part of my brain I don't know about anybody else but yeah. <laughs> Do, do any of you keep a bottle of Crown Royal in your <laughs> desk? Diet Coke. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I'm, I'm a parent in New York, and like that's, if you can do that, I think you can produce anything. Because like, it's just Jenga every day. Every morning my uh, my son wakes up and he's like, so from when he could talk, and he's like, what's happening today? Who's taking me? Who's picking me up? Was, you know, and I swear you could drop him off in London. Yeah, you could drop him off in London and he'd figure out how to get home. Like, you know, just watching us try to figure out hour to hour to hour, you know, it really helps. <laughs> we had another question down here in front. Uh, this is back to the um, question about the, the question about the thick skin. Do you share like through the, the stages of the process, do you share it with colleagues and friends and get feedback, or do you kind of the movie? keep movies, scripts? Because um, I'm a screenwriter and I've shared things before, and sometimes I find it very disheartening, and I don't think it helps me to grow sometimes. But so I was just wondering, like with the film process, is it the same kind of thing? Does I, that make sense? I would say I would say um, whatever. I would say trust your gut a little bit. If you're if you're finding that that that's not not helpful for you, then maybe it isn't at that particular time, I would say. I'm not a writer, but I know my husband is. And I think, you know, not to speak for him, but he is, is also very private about his scripts. He, he wants feedback, and actually, he, I think you need, you need feedback. You need to bounce it off of something. You need to have a, like, that it needs to be a conversation. A lot of times, it's a script. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come alive. So you have to know, you have to have a vision of what it's going to feel like when it's up, when it's up. But, um, but it, but you know, every everybody's process is different. So I find feedback essential because what is your goal? Okay, so what kind of filmmaker do you want to be? The one that makes his art and is like, I don't care, you know, <laughs> whatever. I did what I want to do, and da da. Or do you want to change people? You know, do you want to enhance their lives? So if you if you are this guy or girl that there's plenty and that's fine, totally fine. I want to get the message through, so I definitely mirror back. I show tons of cuts of the documentary with the questionnaires, you know, everything. Jace is writing a new script right now, and you know, when he goes to his friends for feedback, he, it, when he gets it, he says, I care about that, I don't care about that. If they say, like, oh, I didn't like the girl, I didn't like the lead girl, he, he's fine with that character, you know, and he doesn't want to hear about it. But he is interested to hear about, does the family dynamic work? You know, be specific about what you want to get through to the audience. You know, I needed a certain message in my documentary to get through. And, if, and when it wasn't getting through, I had to figure out how to make it because, that was so important to me and then that and then that was accomplished but like with a script that's personal or something like that it's like no i'm talking to the one guy or girl that's going to relate to this thing and these other feedback you know this other feedback doesn't apply and i think if you can sort of gauge that then you can 
be safer, you know? <laughs> Are you doing narrative or documentary features? <coughs> narrative? Yeah. Uh, enter in screenplay competitions because you end up getting coverage back from them, mm -hmm. which is, you know, basically a... a and it's all over the board sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and, and, but you can, yeah, and you can look at it and, you know, don't take it personal, of course, this is this person's opinion, but if you get enough pieces of coverage that kind of tend to say the same thing, a right. positive or negative, right. then you can kind of start to weigh, maybe look I need at what to make repeats. some changes, maybe people aren't getting this through line or this subplot and I need to expand a little more, people aren't understanding what's going on. Yeah. Um, um, and then for every writer on the planet, realize that the moment your script goes into production, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it changes on the day. I've never ever worked on a film where the script that I got in the very beginning mm -hmm was the same script we had at the end of the movie. It just doesn't work. It just stuff changes. It changes for location, it changes for actors, it changes. It just happens. Actors are like, I don't want to say this. I want to say this. And then yeah. it, it just it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. But you do your best to get it as close as possible. And take as much feedback as you can and don't take it personal because it's just an opinion. Use it to your advantage that someone's trying to help you in their mind improve your script and it's up to you as the writer to decide yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, maybe I can let this one go. And yeah. You can tell them the feedback if they want to help you or if they're just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I can say that uh, one of my early professional experiences, I was writing a show for Canadian television, but I was in Los Angeles. And um, one day after sending out our first draft, we get this giant manila envelope. And all it is is feedback oh on God. the script from, I have no idea, but 30 people. Yeah. Everyone who works at TV Ontario, has, as far as I can see, has commented on the script. And it's like, love the wife character, hate the wife character, right. definitely lose the wife character. The wife character should be yeah. the lead character. <laughs> yeah. And um, I called our executive producer in a fit, and I was just like, what the hell? You know, tell me who here, uh, who has sent me paper that signs checks? Yeah. And those, that's what I want to read. And she got so upset. <laughs> it actually kind of ruined our relationship because, <laughs> and it was my fault. Because really what I should have known is just read it and anything that resonates with me as a writer, yes. keep it. And anything that doesn't, forget it. And so that's my, that would be my um, advice in that case. Get as much feedback as you can. We're communicators as well. I mean, we're artists, but we're also communicators, and we only know whether our communication is working if we have feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. The, everything I could add has been said. Yeah. So, your experience is. Yeah. And also realize there's a lot of uh, as you move up in the ranks into bigger companies, mm -hmm. call it studio level. There's a lot of mid mid level managers that have really nice jobs mm -hmm. that don't want to lose those jobs. And so you'll get a lot of comments from those people as this is, I'm doing my job. <laughs> yes. Okay, I, I commented on that script, see boss? That is true. true. Yeah, that there's is a true. lot of that that goes on yeah. too. So, so you can kind of, you know. Of course, up there, there's also political consideration about who wants to be behind what project. That too, and, yeah. And who is allied with whom on a project. Mm -hmm. So you have, there's other factors that you have to take into consideration sometimes. And also, it's like, who, who is giving you feedback? I think as you climb in the ranks, there's people that you'll get to have feedback from that you, re you really want to listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. that's the thing about building a filter, like building a filter, building your, your, you want your understanding of, oh, what am I going to listen to? You, you have, like, we also, you have to have feedback, obviously, but you'll, I think at, sometimes when you're first starting out, everybody's a critic and everybody thinks they know what they, what is good or not. So you can't listen to everybody, but you have to listen to some people and that's just yeah. difficult to figure out. And to Tiffany's um, earlier statement, the, you know, you get around you a group of people, your tribe, your crew, or whatever. And even as a writer, I mean, you, you may not be going out and making stuff, but the people who you trust to give you um, valuable feedback or whose perspective you understand yeah. and so you know where their feedback is coming from, get these people around you, a small group, and let them yeah. read everything. Mm -hmm. I also want to make a, a point about page count. <laughs> which, Please do. Which okay. is always, uh, there's two sides of this coin. You, know, you get people will say, oh no, your script's got to be you know, 95 pages or 100 pages. And, and I, I had a script that, I, that I've written that I'm you know, shopping around town. And 
it's 135 pages. And I, I really got tired of people saying, oh, you need to cut 20 pages. They didn't even read the script. Oh, you need to cut 20 pages. Like, yeah. So I went on IMDb, and I don't know if everybody's looked at the IMDb top 250 films uh, of all time as rated by IMDb users. And I went through each one of them, created this huge spreadsheet on their <laughs> per minute count. Nice. Of the top 250 movies of all time. So this is supposed to be our best movies. Right. Anybody want to take a guess what the uh, per minute count is average on those movies? I'd love to know. 140. 144 minutes. Yeah. So if anybody comes in and says, you need to cut 20 minutes off that movie, you're welcome to use that stat. Now, um, that, that the greatest movies of all time, uh, on number that one. Note, on that note, that's the greatest movies of all time. Right. You know what I mean? well, that's what we're supposed to be trying to make, correct? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But I do think, like, you know, it, when you're starting out, like, I, like, just to give, like, starting out advice to, like, you're not going to make the greatest movie of all time your first go around. No. Probably. I can't imagine you would. You're, you've been in the business for quite some time. It can happen. <laughs> no, but you've also you, you've been around. So yeah, I know. I'm, I know. I'm definitely not. But, it's not a but I'm saying, attack, don't, but. don't. If somebody comes in and says, you, you know, cut 20 pages, that means yeah, your yeah. script. That's, yeah. you that's just a read. ridiculous <laughs> sure, note. Sure, sure. I mean, it's one thing to trim it and keep it nice and lean and mean. It's another thing if you've written a really epic script, then yeah. you know, you've written an epic script. Yeah, there's a place <laughs> for those too. I mean, but I, the, the reality is, there are some people who are going to go like too heavy. You know, yeah. Yeah. too many that pages, true. That is true. not reading yeah. it. That is true. So that is, that's unfortunate, as, as you're running into, right? Mm -hmm. That is unfortunate. Yeah. Other questions? We have one right here. Yes, yeah, so this is for the panel. Uh, you're in the film festival now. After the film festival is over, what are your dreams for your films? Are, do you have distribution deals going on? Are they going to be on cable? Or will we see any other format in theaters or anything like that? Well, uh, well, we actually, we got distribution, um, which is awesome. So uh, this is actually our 15th festival. It, it's looking like it'll be our final festival. We've gotten in, uh, invited to a few more, um, but uh, we, we're going to, I think, we're, we'd like to end on a high note. Cleveland has been amazing, yeah. by the way. This festival is incredible. If you guys can see movies here, please do do so. It's what a phenomenal festival. It's really it's exceptional. scheduling. It's exceptional um, on that note. But also, so we have distribution. Um, with any luck, we'll have a small theatrical release, maybe. You know, we don't know yet. We just signed it, so that that's part of it. We're going to get the deliverables in, and, and you know, oh, then they're going to start to, to do it. So with any luck, you'll see it. Uh, it'll be released this late summer, and hopefully you'll see it on online platforms, hopefully cable, maybe small theaters, you know. So, Life Hack is the title. <laughs> Again. We're releasing May 11th, All right. domestically, theatrically. Um, we're doing a, uh, right now it's a 10 city release. And then Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. Uh, VOD and iTunes and all of the platforms on May 11th. You can pre order it on iTunes right now, it's up. Um, I just checked our pre sales numbers. They're, they're doing pretty well. We're on our track. Right. Where we want to be. Um, That's phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, yeah. It's been an interesting thing on the pre-sales because I've never had to deal with iTunes pre-sales before mm -hmm. uh, at this at this point. And apparently. If you can get above a certain level, um, that's what gets you on the front page. It's okay. all about the pre-sales. So something to keep in mind. Wow. iTunes pre-sales because they're the only ones that will do pre-sales. Okay. Right. Every, all the other VOD just, yeah, just live and all that. But sure. I've never heard of pre-sales. Yes. But if you go, you pre-order the film. So you go to iTunes, pre-order the film, and, and that's an important thing, yeah. especially when you're building your social campaigns, is to make sure that you're building a social campaign in a manner of that you're going to be able to drive all those people to your iTunes pre-order link when that goes live, wow. and and really help push your film in that manner. Good to know. That is yeah. very good to know. Want another tip? Yeah. <laughs> since since we're here. Since we're here. Uh, it's kind of laughable how dinosaurish the technology is with the cable companies, mm -hmm. right? Everybody has a cable box at home, and you go to the VOD, and you want to find a movie. Um, most of them, you have to start at the top and scroll. Mm -hmm. And most consumers are bored after the letter B. Yeah. <laughs> so there's apparently a two to three times sales increase yeah. if the, your yeah. film starts with the letter, I mean a number, or the letter A or B. Yep. Yeah. And we were originally titled Legacy, and now we're the Assassin's Code. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually not a lot of films that have Assassin in the title. I was looking up um, something else, and like I realized there's not a lot. So that's good. Yeah. Right? Good. Well, there's the, there's a there, we found out there is a there was a film called The Assassin's Code that was made in Japan. Oh, yeah. About ten years ago. Right, um, so they're getting a minor boost from us right now. Yeah. 
I think. But right. uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. We, internationally, we um, we actually released in Japan already. Um, funny enough, they uh, we found the poster, found their, their whole description. It was in Japanese. Had to go to Google to tr Google Translate, and the film they renamed it um, Double. Was it double elimination? No. Something like double elimination, bullet of retribution. Mm, that's nice. <laughs> All right. So we're like thinking about getting t-shirts printed. I'm the producer of double elimination, bullet of retribution in Japan. The director is going to get his. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a great time laughing at that poster. Ben? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, in terms of what's next for our film, it does have a social mission. Um, so uh, my co-director has an organization called the Upstander Project. That is upstander as opposed to bystander, somebody that speaks up and oh. stands up um, when they see injustice or somebody being harmed. Cool. So we'll be using the film in classrooms across the country, right. teacher professional development, social studies conferences um, to sort of help create conversation around bullying, genocide, mascots. Um, and uh, oh, mascots, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one of the things we're going to be doing with the film. It is also a very public television-y type of film. Um, I don't have anything to announce on that today, um, which is all I'll say about that. Um, and uh, I mean, if this is my sort of shameless plug time, you, know, you can see it uh, today at the festival. But if you're also interested in tracking the life of the film or seeing when it's coming for people on a live stream coming to a city near you, you can text the word Dawnland, D-A-W-N-L-A-N-D, to 31996. That's 31996. That's so cool. You can text the word Dawnland, standard messaging rate supply. Um, <laughs> and uh, you'll have the opportunity to join our mailing list and learn about when the film is coming to you. For That's you, really for cool. YouTube, it should be like one of those, like, yeah. You know, like <laughs> Mine's coming out uh, July 31st on all the platforms or whatever. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Somebody give us a good one. Juicy. Oh, okay. Well, it's not a good question, but um, <laughs> it's just a very specific question. I always get curious about um, deals like that. So what is the pre-sale deal in um, iTunes? Like, how many pre-sales do you have to have, and then what do you get? Because yeah, you can read a lot about industry developments and, like, what you really need to achieve, but it's, like, per film, per specific sort of case. Like, what can you share with us about what you know? Thank you. Uh, our initial goal... And it's a very low goal. I, I believe it or not, is 500 pre-sales will get you to start charting. Where Wait, you I'm obsessed with this already. Like, I'm no, so I competitive. I'm so competitive. <laughs> well, obviously, we want to sell as many as we can. But, but 500 is kind of the magic number to get you to start charting and, and show up somewhere on that front page. And the more you have, the farther you get to the left. So when people are opening up their iTunes, and you, know, you want them to see your movie right off the bat. You know, and you're and you're right next to Marvel. You know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably I don't know what movie will be coming out that week. I forgot to check, but there I think there was some sort of Marvel movie that will be that's uh, no, that's tracking um, at the same time for VOD pre-sales release, and you know we're gonna be right next to them. So how is it that you even set yourself up to get 500 pre-sales? What did you do marketing oh, social. wise? Yeah, it's all social. It's all social media. Yeah. Yep. Start with friends, family, and acquaintances. Yeah. Got, got from the beginning of your idea, set up your Instagram. Yeah. And in, an individual Instagram for the project. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any other types of social media that you would say no. the project must have? <laughs> no, Instagram. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing in Facebook. Instagram, Facebook. For the older, yeah. I think you have to have a little. You, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> the older audience, or am I going to start like going over oh, back? What, what's interesting is when we talked to our distributor about you know our social presence, um, they said stick to Facebook, don't do Instagram. Whoa! They said that blows focus. My mind. They said focus everybody to one platform, don't spread it. That, out. That's actually yeah. my question. I just that was their goal was to to have everybody focused on one spot. Yeah. Interesting. Because no. we I didn't do a in website. My, in yeah. my world, in this world of this doc, mm -hmm. I mean, I have like five Facebooks and like a bajillion Instagram. And they, that, but it's a visual community makeup 
Yeah. You know? So mm-hmm. you know your audience uh, yeah, 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 and meet yeah, yeah. them where right. they're at. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, yeah, yeah. But but the goal was to f- the messaging, focus them to one yeah. one spot. And if exactly. it's your own website, even better. Yeah. Right? Get them focused to your website so you can control the message yes. and keep your content fresh. And is, would you say that's essential as well for essential. every phone to have its own website? Yeah. Essential. Yeah. If you also, can. on that note, um, there's a lot of people, especially you know the young people that know social media so well. So there's a lot of people that are trying to be social media coordinators. Mm-hmm. I think that might be an opportunity for some people to be able to partner with people mm-hmm. on a on a very reasonable, like in terms of mon- money mm-hmm. scale, to do that. Yeah. Um, I think we have one more down here. If oh, good. Time. Yes, we do. Yeah, it's actually you. Your film, you said, most of the film in Cleveland? 100%. 100%. What was your favorite location to film at? Severance Hall. That place is amazing. It's so beautiful. We actually, uh, we, um, we had to go there twice because we had, a, the, you know, what I would call our you know, every indie film has its indie scene that is memorable that people talk about. <laughs> and ours happened to be at Severance Hall, and it was, um, boy, I don't want to give away too much because it's an amazing scene. <laughs> uh, so I'm not, yeah, I'm going to keep it a secret. <laughs> pre-sale. But, yeah, but pre-sale, it, yeah, it, it's, pre-sale. The, well, tease us with it a little bit. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's something Peter Stramari has never done in his career. He delivers this chilling seven-minute story about his uh, grandfather who was conscripted into the Nazi uh, the Nazi war effort during World War II. Mm-hmm. And the audiences, when he walked into that scene in our screening last night, um, audibly gasped. Oh. Everybody was like, oh. um, Yeah, awesome. we had quite a few of those. It was nice to hear 400 people laughing, yeah. gasping, yeah. and cringing, and the oh no's, and you know. Yeah. I mean, we've got a Doberman that chases people, that freaks people. It was, yeah. Okay. But the, yeah, Severance Hall, shooting that scene, um, uh, we did a couple of different uh, scenes there for different days, and that was a lot of fun. That is very cool. Well, it looks like uh, we, it is about time for us to, is that one more question or one more minute? Oh, then it is um, about time for us to wrap this up. I want to thank you guys so much for coming thank here. You. Thank and you. And for being with us. Thank you. Go see their movies. Yeah. And if you don't see them now, Go to the theatrical release. In yeah. fact, see them now and go to the theatrical release. Yeah. That's even better. And order Ooh. them on demand. And tell us about but, yours. Yes, and um, they'll be around for a few minutes, I think, mm-hmm. afterwards, if you want mm-hmm. to uh, chat. And uh, thank you guys so much. Thanks, and then st- stay for the next panel, because I see my director back there. So he's, <laughs> yeah. he's funnier than I am. Oh, that's, I don't know, you set a high bar. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We have to go down this way.